So I want to jump right into it. I want to kind of revisit something that was taught on recently, but several weeks ago, and it might have gotten lost in the shuffle of many messages every single Thursday and every single Sunday. We are back at it again in the Word of God. So we are a church that is very spoiled with solid biblical teaching. So much comes from this pulpit that it's hard to even receive it all. But I want to revisit something that I said about the four restraints that God has put in place, four restraints beginning with moral order. The very first restraint God has put in place in his creation is moral order, a conscience. What happens over time if we don't allow the word of God to awaken our conscience is that begins to break down. And what we're seeing in society are consciences broken down, no longer responding to the voice of the Lord or the word of God. And when consciences are deafened, oh, the result is extremely loud. The next restraint God has put in place is social order. Social order that comes to us by way of the family. Father, mother, husband, wife, and offspring, children. Now, the family has been under attack for decades. Now more than ever, if they can remove the father from the equation, the father, according to certain movements, is useless. If you remove the father, the structure of the family begins to break down. Every ill of society can be traced back to fatherlessness and homes that are broken down. If the enemy can break down the family, if he can get the man out of place, he can literally expose that institution that God put in place to raise children, to be disciples of the word, not disciples of the world. The third restraint that we are witnessing being broken down is law and order, moral order, social order, and now law and order. There is a call to defund law and order, the police, and it is an attempt by the enemy to break down if he can break that restraint down, you will see the flooding in of evil and crime like never before. If you think it's bad now, you haven't seen anything yet. Which leads me to the fourth and final restraint. It's the church. It's spiritual order. The church of Jesus Christ. We are the authority on all things spiritual, which means everything because all things in the natural and physical are preceded by the spiritual. That's why the apostle Paul says, stop looking at the flesh and the blood of things happening. There's a war that is raging in the sight unseen realm and it's the spiritual realm. And there's no way for us to push back darkness if we're not putting on the armor of God. It's the church, it's you and I, it's the bride of Jesus. So what's the church's role in history, right here, right now? It's to be what Jesus said we are to be, salt and light. Salt being the preservation to unrighteousness. That's what salt was used for. Salt was used to pack fishes and meats in the days before refrigeration where they would spoil. So the salt was a natural preservative. Now, when Jesus said, you're the salt of the earth, he's like, you are the preservation to the unrighteousness or the decay of the day. The salt then, is supposed to interact, engage culture. Salt is the influential agent that keeps decay and corruption from happening at a faster rate. All we are to do in this position is hold back the decay. Oh, it's inevitable. The Bible says this world is passing away and the lust of it. But we're supposed to, at least while we're here, take as many souls with us to heaven. So salt does that. Light, it is the projection of righteousness. Salt is to the preservation of unrighteousness. Light is the projection of righteousness. What arena is salt and light not supposed to be what God has called it to be in? It's a rhetorical question. There is no arena where salt and light aren't supposed to interact with the ways of the world. Salt and light are what God has put in place to be the final restraint, which is why many people err greatly when they try to say that separation of church and state is something that keeps the church sidelined and silenced. But let me just give you a very brief history lesson. Separation of church and state cannot be found on any of our legislative documents. It's not found in any of our founding documents. It's found in a letter written by Thomas Jefferson to the Dansbury Baptists 
confirming and affirming their fear of having the state impose religion. So he said, don't worry, there's a wall that separates church from state. But let me give you a further history lesson. There'd be no state without the church. The church is supposed to be salt and light in every arena. So there should never be a response from anyone that says, pastor, you're getting too political. By that statement, the person just made what the pastor said political. And the irony is that if something was said from the pulpit that was offensive and the person said it's too political, here's what happened. It actually wasn't political because the pulpit wouldn't speak about it if it was politically correct because political correctness is just go with the way of the masses. Don't open your mouth. Don't talk about it. I want to be biblically correct, which we need to get this church because here's where we're at in human history. Just because an issue has been politicized doesn't mean the church and the Christian should be neutralized. In 2020, every single issue has been politicized. So if we live by separation of church and state, we're gonna come to the conclusion, oh, another issue has been political, which means I can't address it, which means the pastor can't bring it up. But no, 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 no. Every single issue has a spiritual origin as a matter of truth. The Christian's responsibility is to shine light on every issue. We are to lead from a biblical perspective and we are to expose it and or explain it. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 15 and 16 says, but he who is spiritual judges all things. He who is spiritual, here's the word, appraises, discerns all things. He who is spiritual is the Christian who has the Holy Spirit within us, yet he himself is rightly judged by no one. For who has known the mind of the Lord that he may instruct him? We have the mind of Christ. See, most hot button topics today are moral, ethical, biblical before they become political. And just because something has been made legal doesn't mean it's moral. Just because abortion is legal doesn't mean it's moral. And just because something is illegal or unlawful doesn't make it immoral, doesn't make it unethical, and certainly doesn't make it unbiblical. So when the government reaches over its boundary and shuts down churches in California, and if you think we're not far off from that, you need a news flash. So when churches rise and say, no, we're not shutting down, they have their biblical right to gather and worship their God. So what happens is Christians, We'll try to proof text and they'll use Romans 13, one to call out these churches and these Christians for being unloving in the midst of a pandemic. And they'll say, Romans 13, Romans 13 says, let every soul be subject to the governing authorities for there is no authority except from God and the authorities that exist are appointed by God. When you continue to read contextually, Paul's saying every government has been appointed by God. Every king, every president, every emperor, God has put them in place. He appointed them. It says for the reasoning of honoring those that do good and punishing those that do evil. That's the context. Now let's enter into our context. God is saying to the church in America under this United States of American government. Now the fact that I'm even mentioning all these words, people are like, oh, he's getting political. No, no, I'm teaching the Bible. God is saying is right to resist what I have appointed when you're obeying what I have commanded. Which means we are to be upstanding citizens, first and foremost citizens of heaven, understanding that God's will is to bring heaven to earth. My will be done. But we're also to follow the laws of our land until they conflict with the law of our God. Amen. Now, why, why am I presenting this? Because I'm pre presenting it with foresight. Foresight being looking at the signs of the times, discerning what's happening. And I'm seeing that we're on a slippery slope and it's only gonna get worse from here. Now, while the church is in the rightful place, we're gonna be the salt and light, but it's only going to get worse. Let me go by way of history. Before the 1960s, nobody alive during that time would have thought that the Bible and prayer would be removed from the public 
square, yet it happened. The Bible was removed. It was no longer the curriculum and the educational system, and you couldn't pray in the name of Jesus. In 1973, nobody thought that abortion would be legalized, yet it was. But not only in 1973, we're seeing in 2020 how there are states and people trying to push for late-term abortion, so much so that the woman, the wife, the mom can have a choice once the baby comes out, whether or not she wants to keep it. That's what we're up against. Censorship, back in the day, they thought the word damn was extremely inappropriate. Now there's no censorship on over-sexualizing everything from marketing to the latest Netflix series that is exploiting little girls. Here's the sad irony. The rating on that series is M for mature audience, which means the girls in the show wouldn't be able to watch it themselves. We are going down a slippery slope from the legalization of same-sex marriage, from claiming to be whatever gender you want on a spectrum Church, wake up. I'm giving a forecast of what is coming, that there will be a day when being a Christian and preaching the word of God will come with such persecution that you can no longer mention the name of Jesus, lest it be a hate crime. So how do we respond? The midwives in Exodus chapter one, they were told to kill the baby once it came out of the Israelite women, but they decided to fear God and not the king. And what happens is it tells us God blessed the midwives. So they, they, they did not submit to the government because they, they followed God's commandment. The three Hebrew boys in Daniel three, I'll get back to them. Daniel himself in Daniel six, a decree went out that a man cannot petition God or any other man but the king. Daniel said, I'm going to pray to my God. He did so three times that day. Peter and John in Acts chapter 4 and Acts chapter 5 are told they can not speak the name of Jesus. Acts 4.18, they called them, commanded them not to speak at all nor teach in the name of Jesus. That's happening in California. But Peter and John answered and said to them, whether it is right in the sight of God to listen to you more than to God, you judge. Acts chapter 5.29, it's, it's repeated. But Peter and the other apostles answered and said, we ought to obey God rather than than men. Now, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in Daniel chapter 3. This is how this account unfolds. In chapter two, there's this vision or this dream that is interpreted. The king recognizes, his name's Nebuchadnezzar, that his kingdom's not gonna last. In chapter three, he decides to construct this huge image, a golden image, basically saying, my kingdom's gonna last. And then a decree goes out to all the people by the government for them to bow down and worship the image once they hear the symphony of music. Now, I could teach it contextually. I've taught it before theologically, biblically. Here's my Bible over here. I want to teach it practically. Because the music of the media is playing. And so many people are bowing down to the image of the media. Narratives that are built on feelings, not facts. And I'm saying for the Christian, are we just going with the flow of the culture or are we being conditioned by the scriptures to understand I will not bow down to any man but my God. I will not compromise biblical conviction. I'll stand on truth. It's conditioning. Socialism is a conditioning. You can call it social distancing. I'll call it social conditioning. Daniel 3, however, back to the context, points to Revelation 13. Reve th th Revelation 13 is future-oriented. It's a prophetic passage where images are raised up and the masses bow down. In both, Daniel 3, which is teaching us something in history, biblically, pointing to something in prophecy, which is Revelation 13, where the actual Antichrist himself is deceiving the masses. How does that happen? Well, it doesn't happen overnight. It's a slow fade of compromise, of separation of church and state. I'm not gonna get involved because that's political. And by and large, there's a beginning of bowing 
to an image. It's the Antichrist's goal. He's conditioning us now. Both cases involve a deceptive image. Guess what they invoke? Daniel 3 and Revelation 13. Unity. Have you seen signs lately? We're in this together. Unity. If you don't wear the mask, people look at you with anger in their eyes. I guess I have to say, I am not against wearing the mask. If you have immune deficiencies, health reasons, protect yourself. But my role and goal as a minister of the gospel is to care more about your spiritual health, infinitely more than physical health. Infinitely more. I care more about your spiritual health and where we are with the Lord. It's a false unity, false unity is all the people gathering together and as an image is raised up and the people bow down, I see that's happening now and it's the Christian that needs to be conditioned by the scriptures, not by the culture. A culturized Christian is often more informed by the media than the Bible. They're more informed by their own feelings than actual facts. Facts matter. Biblical truth matters. Segue into 2 John verse nine. Remember, we're talking about the deceiver, the spirit of the antichrist in verses seven and eight. For many deceivers have gone out into the world and they do not confess Jesus Christ as coming in the flesh. This is a deceiver and an antichrist. The spirit of antichrist either replaces Christ or opposes Christ. Can you identify both of those? To replace Christ, is to come in the form of religion. They might mention Jesus and good works. Jesus and this ritual. Jesus and some other form, fashion of religion. The other antichrist is totally opposing the things of God. The church and the Christian are the only distinct religion in all of the world. There's no persecution on other religions. You can worship whatever you want unless it's Jesus Christ. Why? Because the church and the Christian have always stood for absolute truth. We've stood for morality. We've stood for life from the womb to the tomb. We stand for righteousness and equity and justice. But justice must first happen between us and God to understand right justice. He says, whoever transgresses and does not abide in the doctrine of Christ does not have God. Okay, let me teach this very quickly. What is the doctrine of Christ? If you have a pen, write this down. The doctrine of Christ is two doctrines in one. This is what John's addressing. The first doctrine is the doctrine of incarnation. That is just a fancy theological word that says God became man. That Jesus is God incarnate. That God with us, that's Emmanuel. The other doctrine is atonement, the doctrine of incarnation and the doctrine of atonement. Can I give it to you poetically so you can remember it? The doctrine of incarnation is God wrapped himself in flesh. The doctrine of atonement is God unwrapped himself in death. God wrapped himself in flesh and then unwrapped himself in death. God wrapped himself in flesh in Jesus Christ. God unwrapped himself in death and paid my sin, your sin, he paid the full price. Those are the two doctrines that fundamental Christianity is built upon. John is saying anyone who claims to have some new knowledge, they do not abide in the doctrine of Christ. They have, ready, transgressed it. That word means they've gone beyond it. They were called in John's day, Gnostics, special knowledge. Last Thursday, I talked about this new special knowledge that is entering the church in the word woke. To be woke is to have eyes to see all types of injustices and inequalities. And if you don't see it, you're the problem. I don't have a problem with that. I have a problem when the non-believing community can claim to be woke and the church can say, yeah, we're woke too. And I'm going, there's a problem there because if you're a non-believer, you don't have spiritual eyes. You don't have a new heart. You don't have regeneration. You don't have the Holy Spirit. You can't possibly see as we see because we've been given illumination to see 
how God wants us to see. It's a new form of Gnosticism. There's also an error of going below the doctrine of Christ. You can go beyond it by adding to it. You can also go below it by not getting to it. What does going below the doctrine of Christ look like? Well, I'll tell you, there's this movement out there that looks, makes Jesus look like a very wimpy and needy savior. Like Jesus is begging people to accept him. Some people will say that prayer. Dear Jesus, I accept you. Really? Shouldn't we be humbled that he accepts us? Shouldn't we be completely floored and surrendered that a holy, perfect God would choose me? All through the scriptures, we see a Jesus who was a lion who laid himself down to be the lamb. His meekness was not weakness. He is not dependent upon humanity. He came to accomplish the salvation of the soul. And any theology that doesn't present the Jesus that calls people to repentance has gone below the doctrine of Christ. That is why the gospel message isn't about acceptance it's about repentance. Remember, Jesus was a public relations nightmare. After the masses were coming to him after miracles, and Jesus goes and says, hey, if you eat my body and drink my blood, you can be my disciples. The disciples come to him later and go, are you out of your mind? There was a line waiting for your autograph to take pictures with you. And you go and talk about eating your flesh and drinking your blood? Jesus says, if that offends you, wait until you see me ascend to my father. In other words, wait until you see the cross. I could picture him pointing at the masses that walked away. It says many left from that moment. You wanna go with them? Jesus wasn't chasing people down. I wasn't begging them, that's not, that's not what I meant. Guys, that's not what I meant. I didn't mean my actual body and my actual blood. No, 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 he said to the disciple, you, the words I speak are spirit, spirit and truth. The flesh profits nothing. Peter got it. He says, where would we go? We're not going anywhere. You have the words of eternal life. You are the Christ, the son of the living God. The message is repentance. The message is put on Christ. When you put on Christ, the Holy Spirit indwells you and the Holy Spirit empowers you to overcome self. That's a problem. Selfishness, self-righteousness, self-confidence. It helps you and empowers you, the Holy Spirit, to overcome sin, which self's attracted to. The Holy Spirit empowers you to overcome Satan. But you have to put on Christ. And putting on Christ is giving your life over to him fresh and anew. Being a disciple is denying self, picking up cross. This is why Paul wrote again back in chapter 13 of Romans at the end. Remember, we began looking at this idea behind government. And in that same chapter, Paul writes this. Do this. You ready? Do this knowing the time. Discern the times. That now is the high time to, ready? True wokeness. Awake out of sleep. For now, our salvation is nearer than when we first believed. Your salvation and redemption is nearer than when you first believed. Christianity should not be shifted into the neutral position. We should be constantly accelerating. He says, the night is far spent. The day is at hand. Therefore, cast off the works of darkness and let us put on the whole armor of light. Let us walk properly with wisdom as in the day, not in revelry and drunkenness, not in lewdness and lust, not in strife and envy. Put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the lust of the flesh. It's like two passengers getting on a plane. And of course, they tell the first passenger that he has to wear a parachute. That's all they tell him. Safe journey, put on a parachute. He sits in his seat. The parachute isn't allowed to sit back. It's uncomfortable. He's looking at the other passengers. Nobody's wearing a parachute. He then begins to get ridicule and mocked by the other passengers for wearing a parachute. Why are you wearing a parachute? Eventually he got uncomfortable. He didn't like being pointed out. 
he takes it off. The other passenger is told the same instruction, put on a parachute, but I wanna tell you why. Because at any time during this journey, you might be required to jump out of the plane. See, what he was told was completely different than the first instructions. And that's what happens when Christians aren't told the full terms of what it means to put on Christ. So we put on Christ and the people around us begin to make fun of us. They begin to mock us and it looks uncomfortable. So we take it off and we start to fit in with the culture and the world. But when I understand the parachute of Jesus Christ is going to require me to jump out of the plane at any moment, at any minute, which means the day of your death is appointed. There is a day that you will die, which means you will stand before God. You just don't know when it is. If I'm told that, I'm gonna wear that parachute. I'm not gonna complain about how uncomfortable it is. And I'm not gonna care what people say about me. It is appointed for man to die once. It is appointed for man to jump because after that's the judgment. John continues in verse 10. This is where I have to teach what he means. If anyone comes to you and does not bring this doctrine, the doctrine of Christ, the doctrine of incarnation, the doctrine of atonement, do not receive him into your house nor greet him. Now the idea here in the days that John wrote this, the only way that an itinerant speaker would be able to find hospitality would be he would stay with that community and homes would be opened up to these teachers. And John is saying, do not even allow these false teachers, these deceivers into your home because to provide hospitality and greet them. Now it's not just like a greeting, like, hey, I salute you, hello. This word greeting means put your blessing upon them. He's, he's calling the Christian to be shrewd, not rude, to be aware. He's not really focusing on hospitality as much as he's calling out the idea about credibility, right? If you take somebody in, you are actually claiming they're credible. Now, of course, I could talk about how this is applicable to Jehovah Witnesses and Mormons. Jehovah Witnesses are knocking door by door. When you let them in your home, here's what can happen. Even though you might not receive the doctrine, which is false doctrine, they might go to your neighbor's house and say, oh, it was just at John and Andrea Mayer's house. They're so sweet. And then your neighbor goes, wait, John and Andrea Mayer let you in? So then they sit with this person and they're naive and simple. And now they're being convinced of this false doctrine. And here's what John is preventing. He's preventing what took place in, I'm going to pronounce this wrong because I couldn't find anywhere on the internet how to pronounce this. This is what happens with the Volicelli. You know what the Volicelli is, right? I know it sounds like a painting or it sounds like a musician, but the Volicelli is a hoverfly, a flower fly, and they have a strong resemblance to the bumblebee. The only difference is the bumblebee has four wings, two sets, four wings. The Volicelli has two wings. They have the same pattern of stripes, yellow and black. And what they do is they disguise themselves because they look like a bumblebee. They go into the nest or the hives of the bumblebee. They lay their eggs. The larvae are birthed. The larvae actually have mandibles and the mandibles begin to devour the bumblebee's larvae. What a return for their hospitality. See, that's what happens when we allow false theology, false doctrine, false teachers into our homes. I'm talking about your, your life. I'm talking about the internet. I'm talking about what you're watching on YouTube. I'm talking about the moment you push that share button, you're affirming that teacher. I see it all the time. I'm like, that person goes to Coastal Christian. They just shared a false teacher sermon. That's why if the doctrine of Christ is not defended, it ends up being defrauded. I want you to think about why they protect and guard expensive paintings in museums. Did you ever wonder that? It's just a painting. What's the big deal? Well, what happens is if it's not defended, if it's not guarded and it gets stolen and this happens a lot, that painting can be counterfeited, replicated, defrauded, and it goes into the black market and a buyer will buy it in the black market. And then they'll take it themselves thinking they have the original piece and they'll get it appraised. Back to that word appraisal. 
And after the appraisal, the person goes, wait a second, this is not the real painting. This is a fraudulent version. It's worth nothing. So we need to guard the truth in our hearts. The Bible says, keep your heart with all diligence. Put the lock of integrity upon your heart. Know the difference between the truth and a lie. Spend more time in the word of God, saturating your heart and your mind with his truth so that you can discern a lie. Understand that with the spiritual mind, God gives you the ability to discern and appraise all things. It's the reason why Peter himself said to the early church in chapter three, verse 15, a very popular verse, sanctify the Lord God in your hearts. First and foremost, this is individual, this is personal. If the Lord Jesus Christ is in your heart, separate, sanctified in your heart, you ready? Always be ready to give a defense to everyone who asks you a reason for the hope that is in you. And often say, people won't ask about the hope that is in you if they don't see that hope on you. The only reason a coworker is gonna say, tell me about what makes you tick. Why are you always smiling when our culture and our society is burning? Please tell me, where do you get that joy? Nobody's gonna ask you to defend your faith. It's the word apologia. It's where we get the word being an apologist, but every Christian is called to be an apologia. Not just guys, God rest his soul, like Ravi Zachariah, not just guys like Lee Strobel, not just guys like C.S. Lewis. We're all called to be apologists, to defend the faith. Now, the evidence that you are a Christian comes by way of your conversion, and your conversion is your transformation. People will know you're different because your present doesn't look anything like your past. But that's not the only evidence that being an apologist requires. Here's why. So you're a Christian, you're born again, whatever that means. Yeah, yeah, God changed my life. Oh, okay. Like that only holds so much weight with certain people. Yeah, but that, that book, it's... It's not real. Are you equipped and educated enough to explain, give a defense for why the book is real? Not just your life has changed, I experienced God. That might not be enough. Here's what I mean. Yeah, that book you believe, it's not even real. It's a book of fables. It's interesting you said that. That book has 66 books in it. It was written by 40 different authors over 1,500 years, 40 authors, all with different backgrounds, different educational experiences. Some were kings, some were statesmen, some were shepherds, some were prophets. They all wrote the same theme somehow. Again, 1,500 years, 66 books, not a single contradiction in that book. Yeah, well, uh, anybody could have done that. Yeah, but let me tell you about the, the main purpose of the book. It's to point to a guy named Jesus, who's the savior of the world. Yeah, but I don't believe that. He probably fulfilled his own prophecies. It, it, was a, it was a fraudulent fulfillment of prophecy. Interesting you say that. One of the prophecies predicts where he would be born. How can you actually fabricate a prophecy about where you'd be born? The only way to do that is if you're God and you planned it yourself. But I wanna get into some of the other details that you need to know. Remember, these numbers are astronomical. The New Testament is actually affirmed and confirmed by 5,800 other manuscripts, other codices, other writings, Greek manuscripts, 5,800. Not to mention the 18,000 plus non-Greek manuscripts. When you put those two numbers together, you get close to 24,000, 26,000 manuscripts. Why is that a big deal? Because the second most affirmed piece of literature in human history is the Iliad by Homer. And it is only affirmed by 1800 plus manuscripts. Julius Caesar's writings, Aristotle's writings, they have no more than 12 to 20 manuscripts that affirm, all of which were affirmed thousands of years after they were written. The Bible, however, was affirmed within a hundred years of Jesus's life. Let me go further. The Old Testament has 42,000 manuscripts and affirming texts that say these events were true. That is a total of 66 thousand external writings, manuscripts that affirm the Bible is true. <laughs> Cannot be denied. 
apologia, defend your faith. Be equipped to explain it. When your transformation isn't convincing enough, people think our faith is based on feelings. Our faith is based on facts. Jesus' resurrection is the most validated event in human history. You know how I know that? Because they can't find the body. John says, of course, as the capstone in verse 11, this is like the final exhortation slash admonishment before he gives the outro, which I'm gonna teach on because it says in the outro, and I'll give you a heads up where I'm going. The outro is basically saying, hey, I'm writing this, this letter. I have so much more to say, but I can only do so face to face. So I'm gonna take the opportunity to say, there's many things that are said from this platform that I don't have the time to address. And I would love to, look at me. I would love to do it face to face. Any questions that someone may have both in the sanctuary or online, you can call the church office and you can set up a meeting and we could talk face to face about what the Bible says. I would love those conversations, which means thank you for your email, but I'd rather talk to you face to face about things you're in disagreement with. For John says, he who greets him shares in his evil deeds. Now you go, wait, 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 this is pretty harsh. This is the apostle of love. Remember John was known for love. Yet he's like, no, 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 you don't understand. When you affirm a false teacher, a deceiver, when you greet him, that word is God's speed, that word is God's blessing, you share in his work. John is saying it is possible here for us to be so open-minded that we are actually empty-headed. And when you are empty-headed, your heart is un guarded. He's saying, be cautious who you affirm, be cautious who you greet, but he's not talking about those as Pastor Matt said this past Sunday, those who are deceived. He's talking about the deceivers. He's not talking about those who slip in error. He's talking about those who are propagating the lie. He's talking about those individuals, the mouthpieces, the enemies of the truth. So I wanna, I wanna end where I began. I wanna end by reminding us in light of these charges, in light of these admonishments for all of us, that the culture currently is conditioning people to be tolerant, while the scriptures should be conditioning us to be obedient. Let me add to that. The culture conditions us to become tolerant to what? The culture. <laughs> the culture is conditioning people to be tolerant to the culture. The scriptures are conditioning Christians to be, to or to be obedient to the scriptures. In other words, whatever you spend more time exposed to is going to be priming you, preparing you, conditioning you. And by way of that formation, you will follow it. That is the pattern of our lives. And I wanna be a Christian who spends time in the scriptures, being conditioned by the word of God, being primed and prepared for the works of God. What are the works of God? You're the salt of the earth. You're the salt of the earth. You are the light of the world. Remember the salt in its rightful place interacts with a godless culture, with a godless society and is a preservative. The preservation against unrighteousness. What does light do? Light shines, light exposes, light illuminates. Light actually is the only agent that can push back darkness. Nothing else. I've said this before, but it's like, it's such a simple analogy. When I come into the sanctuary late at night and it's pitch black in here, I can command the darkness to flee all I want. Flee in the name of Jesus. It's still dark. That don't work. That don't work. I'm telling you, it don't work. Not that in the name of Jesus doesn't work, but in the name of Jesus is the nature of Jesus. I can come here and preach my lungs out in the dark. At the end of the sermon, my eyes will only have adjusted to the darkness. No, 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 I come in and there's a light switch and I literally just go and the light takes care of the darkness. See, it's the light of Jesus in us that shines through us. When you live it, people see it and like a moth, they might be attracted to it or like a roach, they might run from it. But either or, the Christian is to be the salt of the earth and the light of the world. That's the charge, that's the challenge. And since we're not dead, we're not done, 
We've heard it by God's grace. Holy Spirit, empower us to do it. Let's pray.